Thanks, babe. Do, 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 do. I got you, babe. I thought you all started singing along. Before we start today, I'd like all the kids, would you just stand up, kids? All the kids in church. Stand up. Oh, I can't see you. I just want to tell you guys something. Are you listening to me? Everybody look, all the kids look in my eyes. Can I just tell you something? You guys are doing such an amazing job of sitting in church. I, I am amazed you're doing so. I mean, I knew you could do it. Some of your parents didn't think you could. I knew you could do it. And you're doing good, and I love it when you're here. Yeah, come on. Give them a round of applause. Woo! Good job. I think that all the kids should deserve ice cream from their parents after church today. All right. You're welcome. No, you guys really are doing good. I even noticed some parents are taking advantage of the opportunity. Like Ben and Kaylee have trained their little baby to go around and start looking in people's wallets. I just saw it this morning. Judah went, checked Carlisle's wallet for cash. None in it. He just put it back and crawled back to mommy and daddy. It's smart, guys. It's smart. I really think it is. I'm just kidding. No, you got, the kids are doing so good. I'm, I'm actually, I love having you here because sometimes you talk back to me and the adults are just boring and sleeping, some of them. <clears throat> just my dad up here. He's the only, Grampy is the only one that falls asleep in church. But you guys are doing great and I'm so glad you're here. He's earned it though. He has me for a son. I don't blame him. I'm probably going to sleep in church one day too if one of my sons is preaching all the time. <laughs> just, Lord, please spare me. Spare me from the incessant joking and teasing and bothering and harassing. And... But uh, anyways, well, the title of today's message is Hearts on Fire. And I really feel like um, in the series At the Cross, the Holy Spirit has been leading me in a direction for our church. And I just got to tell you, church, I, w- I need to see, I think the Holy Spirit is inviting us to come to a place of new passion for Jesus. One of the things that we're seeing happening right now in the world is a line being drawn, and there is a difference, a clear difference in those who are simply admirers of Christ and those who actually follow Christ. And I want you to know this morning that following Jesus involves passion for Jesus above all else. If you find, let me just say, this is free this morning, and so love me or hate me, it matters not to me. But this one is free for you. If you find yourself being passionate about other issues, other social causes, other hobbies, other interests, if you're more passionate about those than Jesus, I have to tell you, something is off. Something's off in your walk. Something's off in how you're aligned with the Holy Spirit. And so today is an invitation to consider what it was like for the early church, for those few followers of Jesus who were waiting to see. And we're going to be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 24. I did it again. I have dry throat from feeding cows. Hay is moldy and dusty at this time of year. I put a hauls in. Now I have a hauls tucked in, so just I need one moment. Mm. Hauls are so good. That's my Sunday morning breakfast. Mm-hmm. High in vitamins and sugar. Okay. Woo. Luke chapter 24. Sorry, I'm just trying to fill the space. <clears throat> Verses 13 through 35. Oh, that last gob was scratchy. <clears throat> Here's what it says. Now that same day, two of them, we find out that they're followers of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they walked, they discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in the word and deed before God and all the people. 
The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish are you and slow to believe all the, what all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. Someone say opened. And they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Well, this is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. And I've shared it with you before, I'm sure. But I love this story, I think, more than some of the others because this is actually your story and my story. You see, we've, we've all hopefully had an encounter with Jesus on the road of our life as we're traveling to and from or going wherever we're going or moving in the things He's leading us or calling us to. I hope that we've all encountered Jesus. I was talking with Ben this week, and he, he, he brought something to my memory that I have forgotten long, long ago from Bible college days, and that's the practice of the Puritans. And the Puritans believed that everyone who was going to be a follower of Jesus needed to have what they called a Damascus Road experience. They actually believe that you could be baptized, you could, you could repent, and you could do all those things, but every Every true follower, every believer should have this experience where they encountered the living Jesus. Sadly, that is not the practice of most churches today. What's more is they would even get together then and corporately judge whether or not the experience you claim to have was legitimate. I imagine if you were just making it up, the Holy Spirit was revealing that to them, and they would say, well, I think you need to go and try again. If I can be really transparent with you, that's what I want for my kids more than anything. I want them to have their own experience with Jesus in the way that I've had an experience with Jesus. It's not good enough that your children and my children come and sit in church and learn about Him and are admonished, raised up in the way they should go. I mean, it's great. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. But isn't the most wonderful thing that personal encounter that we're all looking to have with Jesus? I love what happened on the way and when Jesus broke bread. Those are the two significant things that jump out at me in this story. What happened on the way and when he broke bread You see, as they were on the way and he began to explain everything in the scriptures concerning himself, something amazing happened. Their their hearts caught fire. And that should happen for each one of us. At the cross, our hearts should be set ablaze. There should be something that happens in us when the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. When we come to that place of reckoning and reconciliation where all of who we are is insufficient, but we are able to substitute the life, the perfection, the holiness, the righteousness, the goodness of Jesus in place of our mess. 
And for most of us, I think, when we have that realization, we are overwhelmed. And I'm not simply talking about overwhelmed as an emotional experience, but as a total, a whole life experience. Like me, you're probably done with emotionalism. And there is stages of life where we're emotional and it feels good to be emotional. But very quickly we realize that there is an emptiness in emotionalism because emotion is just a chemical reaction in your brain. But salvation is a spiritual reality of your heart. And that's what we're grasping. That's what we're reaching for. That's what we're groping for. The world was groping in darkness, longing for, looking for a Savior. And that's what they hoped for, even if they didn't know it. You and I ought to hope and reach for the same thing today. While Jesus walked with them along the road, their hearts were set ablaze. Can I just ask you, when's the last time you felt your heart set on fire with that passion for Jesus? Maybe it's never even happened to you. And I want you to know this morning that that's okay because maybe it's as simple as someone never telling you that that actually is the way it can be. You actually can have a relationship with Jesus that sets your heart on fire for the things that have set his heart on fire. What is the thing that his heart is on fire for? Souls. This world. The lost, the broken, the hurting, those in need of healing. Uncompromising in his virtue. God's heart is for this world. I see lots of people today <clears throat> developing a heart for the world, but in that development, they are misapplying Scripture. In a desire to have a heart for the world, they begin, to, they begin to take the importance off of the important things about who God is. And that's something that can't happen because when it happens that way, it begins to, it begins to drain the real passion out of what it means to follow Jesus. And you end up with emotional people looking for a purely emotional relationship that is devoid of change and ultimately devoid of Jesus himself. Maybe you need this morning to have your heart set on fire by Jesus. And if it hasn't been that way for you for a long time, I submit to you as a friend, your heart can be set on fire again for Jesus. I'm reminded that the Scripture says, that God does not snuff out a smoldering wick or break off a bruised reed. See, that's you and I lots of times. We're lacking in passion. We're lacking in that great revelation of what He's done for us. And life becomes mundane and ordinary. We begin to miss obedience. We begin to miss the opportunities to do the amazing things that He predestined us for. And it's because we've... We, We've lost the fire. We've lost that passion. We've lost that burn, that zeal for Jesus. Not about the feeling, once again, but the revelation of what happened at the cross. I love how Jesus brought himself into focus by all of Scripture. Jesus brought himself in that conversation with them and later with his disciples. Jesus brought himself and the parts of him that were obscured by Old Testament law into perfect clarity. The culmination of who Jesus is through all of Scripture is a wonderful and amazing revelation. And if you don't have it, I want, I want you to get it. I want you to appreciate it. I want you to see it. I want you to know it because knowing it is knowing Him. You see, He is and His Word is the bread of life. That is where your life comes from. The life I live, I now live in Christ. It says in Galatians 2.20. But how does that happen? How does it happen that while walking on the road to Emmaus, that Jesus walks along with them and 
their hearts catch on fire. What, what is the formula here? Well, I hate to make it so simple, but it really is. It's time with him. You see, time with Jesus is the key to your passion for Jesus. Because it's hard to be passionate about the things you don't spend any time in. I'm interested to watch in my own life, in the lives of my children, in the lives of most of you, how our passions follow our time. We fixate on an item, an opportunity, and that becomes the most important thing to us. And that's not necessarily wrong at all. It's justifiable and it's even right in many cases to pursue something with passion. But the problem is, is if we pursue those things with a passion that we're not pursuing Jesus with, it's more important than He is. And now we have an idol. You see, as Jesus walked along the road with Him, time was passing. And as time was passing, a relationship was being built. And revelation was flowing out of that relationship. You know, if you want to understand who Jesus is according to all the Scriptures, here's part two. You're going to need to read the Scriptures. It does little good for Jesus to come and explain to you and I how He fits in from the very first verse of the Old Testament to the last verse of the New Testament when we haven't read any of it. And so if you want your passion for Jesus to increase, might I suggest reading the Word, Who Became Flesh, and dwelt among us. Because something amazing happens when we read the Word of God, the Logos Word of God, the living Word of God, the Rhema Word, becomes apparent and powerful in our lives. It's that Word that is embedded in our heart like seeds that need to sprout, that the Holy Spirit relies on in you and I to bring to our remembrance all the things that Jesus taught. Well, I didn't know that Jesus taught that. Well, how are you supposed to know that Jesus taught that? Well, my pastor's supposed to teach me. Sure. Once a week, about half the weeks of the year, it doesn't work that way. You have to read the Bible. And no, you shouldn't develop your own opinions without understanding the context of it. But you should read so that the Holy Spirit can begin to guide you and bring you into the truth, bring you into the things that Jesus wants to bring to your memory, bring you into this passion that I'm talking about this morning. You need time with Jesus. You need fellowship with Jesus. You actually need to be traveling somewhere with Jesus. It can't be lost on us this morning that Jesus simply met them on the road while they were going somewhere because I want you to hear this. It doesn't matter if you're the oldest person in this auditorium or watching online or you're the youngest person. The truth is, is Jesus is willing to meet you on whatever road you're on, wherever you're going. He wants to have a meeting with you. And He actually wants to reveal Himself to you. And He wants you to know who He is and why He came and where you could be going. That's what He wants. Jesus wants to prove Himself to you by all of Scripture. That's what He wants. And then the second part that we read in the story, Jesus wants to break bread with you so that you can recognize Him. See, What's happening right now in many people's lives is they're walking and they're having an encounter of sorts with Jesus. They're having an encounter with the Holy Spirit whom they don't know, but because of the environment, because there are saints praying for them, because you and I are in the world and living an example that brings life to other people, there are people in your life who are experiencing Jesus on the road in their life. But unless they begin to break bread with Jesus, I'm afraid Jesus won't be revealed to them. You see, when we come to church and we gather and we dedicate ourselves to things like singing and worshiping and the public reading of Scripture, what we're doing is we're breaking the bread of life and distributing it to each other. And that's the point when our eyes become open to see who Jesus is. 
And it can happen at church, or it can happen in your living room at home, or it can happen in your truck while you're driving somewhere. But unless you are breaking the bread of life, unless you are eating that part of, of who Jesus was and is in His ministry, it's going to be hard to recognize Him. And I know that that might seem contrary to you, but I want to point out, if you continue to read in Luke chapter 24, the next verses, you're going to find out that that, that that same idea and that same reality existed for the rest of the disciples and the rest of the followers who had just watched Jesus die. See, when these two men on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and his unnamed friend, realized it was Jesus, and Jesus vanished, the Bible goes on to say that immediately they got up and headed straight back to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with him. And they begin to talk about what had happened. And as that discourse was taking place, suddenly Jesus was in the room with all of them. And the Bible says in Luke 24 that the disciples and those gathered there with Cleopas and the unnamed friend now in that room were in disbelief even though Jesus was standing right there with him. Jesus had to say things like, okay, come here, touch me, put your your fingers in the holes in my hands inside because a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like I do. They came and they touched Jesus, and they still couldn't believe it was really Him. So this is what's amazing. You know what Jesus asked for next? Hey, do you guys got anything to eat? They gave Jesus, it says, some broiled fish. Some broiled broiled fish. I don't know what boiled fish is, but it probably isn't very good. They gave him broiled fish, and he ate it in their presence. And this is what it says. I want you to read for yourself in Luke 24 this week. When Jesus ate that fish, they realized who he was. All of a sudden, the reality of Jesus and his resurrection was there in the room with them in his fullness, in the full realization of who he was. Jesus in a glorified body was not enough for them to say, oh, it's Jesus. What was it? was eating fish. Fellowship with Jesus is how you and I and every person who will walk this earth ever will recognize Jesus for who he is. Fellowship with Jesus. You say, well, I hear that there are Muslims who get saved because Jesus has a dream. Yeah, Jesus walks into people's dreams and they have a road to Emmaus, a Damascus road encounter with Jesus. And what do you think happens next? They begin to fellowship with the bread of life. They begin to fellowship with other believers. And as they do, the reality of Jesus begins to make more and more sense to their carnal minds. And a disciple is made. Once they recognized who Jesus was, again... Jesus then unpacked for the eleven and all those who were gathered like he did for Cleopas and the unnamed friend. All that the Scriptures had to say concerning who he was. I would give anything to be in that room. I mean, I I would give my most valued possessions in this world up to be in that room, to be taught by Jesus that way. But the truth is, I have found myself in a room with Jesus many times. And while I can't see him with my eyes, as I read his words, his presence becomes tangible in my space. So much so that I feel like I can hear his voice. So much so that I feel like I can feel his body heat. I don't know that I've ever shared this story with you, but many years ago, I was in a prayer meeting. And I was leading worship for the prayer meeting. And whether I was on a guitar or a piano, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But the church was a fan-shaped church, and it had a, an auditorium. And as we prayed and worshiped, and, and there, it was a passionate time of, of prayer, I looked up, and I had a, a vision 
of Jesus standing in the upper balcony over the 40 or 50 of us who were gathered there for prayer. I was actually so excited, I left my instrument and ran off the stage, and I, I hurried up the stairs as quickly as I could, and I got to the place where I had seen Jesus standing, and as I put my feet in the place where his feet had been, and I was wearing socks, I, f- I felt the heat. <laughs> I felt the physical presence of Jesus. Now, that might not matter to you, but it mattered greatly to me. That reality is almost unbelievable as I look back on the history of my relationship with Jesus. But I know it to be true, and I know that it happened. And it's a part of my testimony, and that revelation and that moment for me was one of several, one of maybe even many that I've had, where I know that Jesus is with us. I want you to have that revelation. You see, it's not just that I want to see a church. It's not that I just believe the Holy Spirit wants to see a church with hearts set on fire. It's that I believe we cannot be who God is calling us to be unless we are a people whose hearts are set on fire. We we can't do it. We can't be the light of the world if we are not ablaze with passion for Jesus. Maybe you forgot that you are called the light of the world. But you are. You're the light of the world. You're the means by which God intends to work salvation through the rest of the earth. Yes, through Jesus. But you see, you and I are His body. Lots of days we don't feel like it. Lots of days we probably don't act like it. But he wants you to have the moment. And many more moments of knowing him. Knowing his passion, knowing his peace, knowing his presence, knowing this amazing reality that he has for you and I. As I was playing around with my notes this morning to finish this up, the the old hymn, Alas and Did My Savior Bleed, was just in my head and my heart. Actually, it was even in my eyes. I I couldn't get the words out of my vision. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. That's how strong it was in my mind. It says, Alas and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. chorus goes, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart was rolled away. It was there, by faith, I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. The verses that follow that are as amazing as the first in the chorus. Was it for crimes that I had done? that he groaned upon that tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart was rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. The only irony I have with that song, this ironic memory, from my childhood to present, is why a song that ends in happy all the day is so slow and almost somber. (laughs) And it actually, like you, makes me laugh. But the reality is this, the weight of our sin is heavy. And the weight of the death of Jesus on my behalf is heavy. But guys, the resurrection reality of Jesus counterbalances that profoundly. 
It becomes amazing. It becomes wonderful. It becomes hopeful. It becomes absolutely shiningly true. When we invest our time, when we put ourselves in the place of Cleopas and his unnamed friend on a road, when you're driving in your vehicle, when you're with your children, when you're awake at night and can't sleep, would you know today that Jesus, he wants to meet you on the road wherever you are? And all you really have to do now is say, Lord, I'm here. Where are you? I hope that you can have the audacity to ask him that question this week. I hope that you'll have the audacity to say, Lord, I don't feel the passion the pastor said I should feel. I want that passion. I want that hope. I, I, I want to be so amazed that even if you walked into this room, I wouldn't be able to believe it until you made me make you something to eat. That kind of passion. The kind of passion that makes you leave everything behind to follow what he wants. I want my kids to know that passion. I want your kids to know that passion. We need our church to reflect that passion. Right now in social media, people are arguing back and forth over Grace Life Church in Edmonton. We got one side saying, the world is watching. Obey the government. We got the other side saying, the world is watching. Obey the Lord. To me, that's all misplaced passion. Passion must be first and foremost for Jesus. Above all, beyond all, passion must be for Jesus. And wherever his lordship takes you and I will be just fine after that. If it takes you to prison, and it, that's the reality, if his lordship takes you or me to prison, that's okay because passion trumps it. If it takes us to a mission field, it's okay because passion trumps it. If it takes you back to a spouse you don't want to be around anymore, that's okay because passion for Jesus trumps marriages. And by the way, for the record, passion for Jesus will never divide a marriage. At the cross, we encounter the beginning of something amazing in salvation. But it is only the beginning of something amazing. And I want you to know today that the next step after the cross is to encounter a risen, living Jesus. Not a storybook, not an emotion not a fad, not a way of thinking about the world, but the person. I want to pray for you this morning, but before we do, I want us to stand and remind ourselves again together what Galatians 2.20 says. Come on, why don't you stand up? Pastor Amy's going to come in just a moment and close the service today, but this we're committed to. And I believe that there's power in these words. And I believe that when you make declarations over your life because God created you and He said the power of life and death lies in your tongue, I believe that when we speak the Word of God over our lives and over one another, something changes in our reality. That's why we're reading this together last week, this week, and next week. So let's do it. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. One more time. I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now we're going to do it one last time, but I would really like to think that we get stronger every time we say it. And we will. So one more time. Kids, you should be able to say this loud. Right? Right, okay. Right. One more time. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Amen. Father, I just pray for each person standing in this place that Jesus, You would speak to us. God, that You would reveal Yourself to us. Lord, that there would be courage in every heart to ask You for an encounter, to trust You for a miracle of Your presence in a new way and in a fresh way. Holy Spirit, we ask, I ask for each person here that You would bring us into a new deep place of passion, of excitement for who You are and what You want to do through Your body in this world. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Amy. Amen. Amen. There I am. <laughs> all right. You know, kids, parents often don't work very hard at their memory verses, so you're going to have to help them this week. They have one more week at that verse. So whatever it takes, maybe they need to do some artwork or like a cue card. You guys help them, okay? Okay. Um, if you want prayer today, you can come. If the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you, maybe you have a need, maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, you've never made him the boss of your life, today can be that day. Maybe you don't have that passion stirring in your heart and you just need someone to lay hands on you and um, you want to you wanna make a commitment or you want you want to talk to someone, you can do that today. If you're online, you can uh, go to the website. Someone will be in touch with you. But don't, don't do life alone, okay? It's the breaking of bread. It's the, it's the being together. And I know that it's hard right now, but we have to be creative. And we just can't be alone. We can't be isolated because it's those precious moments that Jesus is revealed when we're walking, when we're eating, and when we're together, right? So online, we'll see you when we see you or in the in the typing zone, I don't know. Have a great week. And um, the rest of you, come if you need prayer. And let's just have a great week. Yeah. <laughs>